Hi, Kristen Atchison here, and this is our second lecture um, discussing Chapter 9. Um, this lecture is about education and schooling. So let's first talk about kind of that segue. We were, we were at intelligence, now we're at schooling, kind of that segue between that. So we're going to start with giftedness and creativity. So creativity is this ability to generate novel outcomes that have value. So not just creating something novel that's not useful, but something that has value, something that actually um, can contribute something. And part of creativity is divergent thinking. And divergent thinking is the ability to generate multiple solutions to a task. So sometimes the ways that they'll test divergent thinking is they'll say, um, you know, here's, you know, a stick. Come up with as many uses as you can for this stick. Um, and that would be an, a divergent thinking task. You're having to come up with multiple solutions for this item. Um, any kinds of, when you're doing creative thinking, you're trying to do this, you're engaging in this um, divergent thinking. And creativity is requires these skills of divergent thinking. Um, it also requires knowledge about the problem, about the area that the problem's in, and you have to be able to evaluate those ideas generated. So remember, it's not just generating novel ideas that don't have any value, that a value is important, and how you know it has value is if you have knowledge of that problem area, you have knowledge of that domain, and if you can evaluate whether those are good ideas or not. Creative, creativity also requires some personality attributes. Um, you have to really have tolerance of, to ambiguity. You have to be okay with the gray areas. It doesn't have to be black or white. It can be muddled and in the middle, and that has to be okay. Um, you also have to have willingness to take risks. Um, so creativity comes with failure, right? So we, I've already said several times um, in different things, mistakes are proof that you're trying. And I say that partially because we're going to mess up. If we're going to have any kind of new idea um, or new learning or new anything, we have to have that ability, that willingness to take a risk and to, to make a mistake and to be wrong. Um, again, not all of those novel ideas are going to be the best idea. Um, and so we have to have the ability to take risks. Another contribution to this divergent thinking and this crisis um, creativity to some extent is confirmation bias. Um, so if you remember confirmation bias from your intro class, we don't focus in on as much here, um, but it's the idea that you want to be right. <laughs> and you can see how that could get in the way of creativity and divergent thinking. If you want your idea um, to be right, and so you're going to believe ideas that already fit with what you think is right, if you have that bias to believe those, then you're stifling creativity and you're stifling divergent thinking. And so confirmation bias and your, you know, and our propensity to engage in it actually is a roadblock. Um, to divergent thinking and a roadblock to creative thinking. So there's two kinds of thinking that we talk about in terms of education, one of which is convergent thinking. And this is your multiple choice questions, right? So when you take a quiz, um, there's one right answer, and that's convergent thinking. Um, there's one right answer. So all of the information converges um, to a point, and that point is the correct answer. This is also what's really been emphasized on intelligence tests. And we talked a little bit about how those have some issues with validity and those sorts of things. Part of that and part of the criticism that they get has to do with this issue of convergent thinking. Because we see some of the really smartest people and the most innovation comes out of divergent thinking. Again, this generating multiple unusual possibilities. And this is really, really important for our culture. You can't have innovation. You can't have um, new ideas and new things um, if everybody comes to the right same one answer. If everybody has convergent thinking, if we only think there's one right answer, then you can't improve things. You can't make things better. Um, you can't create new things. Um, so this ability to produce original and appropriate work is really important in um, creativity and divergent thinking. So in this task here, 
kids were given a circle um, or a series of circles and they were told hey you need to make them into something and different kids did different things this is a divergent thinking task so we have eyeglasses we have it was used as a giant letter O we had it used as a stop sign as planets as wheels um, as a pumpkin as faces as a wheelchair all these different kinds of things um, and again those are divergent thinking there wasn't one correct answer of what to do with the circle or what to do with these circles um, it was creative it was divergent um, the idea that you can do different things um, so Again, that's going to be really, really important. We'll see um, in different venues and different avenues. Part of when that's important depends on the culture. Um, so culture and cognitive effects of schooling. Schooling doesn't affect basic cognitive problems processes like Piaget thought. Um, so schooling doesn't make you smarter, um, but it does affect the rate at which they're acquired. So you get more information um, in this organized schooling model, um, in this teaching model. I don't necessarily mean organized school, but in this teaching model. Schooling also assists in the development of formal operations. So we talked about one of the drawbacks to Piaget's formal operations is that not everybody got there. Um, we see that some of those less industrialized cultures, cultures, cultures that don't have this emphasis on education, don't have, those kids don't get to this formal operations. Think of your kinds of assignments that I give you um, for, um, for your essays, right? Those essays are asking you um, to do these hypothetical higher order thinking. That's formal operations. And schooling is a teaching you how to do that. Schooling also teaches children to use memory strategies. So, I mean, think back to, you know, elementary school, all the different ways that you were given to remember something. Um, my daughter's currently learning about different kinds of rocks in her science unit. Um, and she came home singing a song about the different kinds of rocks. School taught her this memory strategy of singing um, as a way to remember these different kinds of rocks. Schooling also, um, schooling affects cognitive, again, because we're teaching specific skills. Um, so we can, when you teach someone to read, then they can go out and read a book and get that knowledge from themselves, um, as opposed to having to have someone else teach it to them. Um, so again, we, it, those skills can change that cognition, can change that rate in which we get that information. It emphasizes general rules to and we apply them to specific instances. It promotes those really verbally based abstract models of thought. So when we teach, we talk. When you take notes, you write down words. Um, this is all that kind of verbally based stuff. Um, and these abstract models of thought, a lot of times you're given hypotheticals. A lot of times you're thinking you're given ways to uh, hypothesize or do your best guess as to what you think is going to happen. And you can see how schooling has had that effect. If you, when you're in kindergarten, it may not necessarily be that you can't do this because you are a kindergartner because of your age. And it has a lot to do with the education you've had up to that point. And obviously it promotes literacy um, because not only are you actively being taught to read and write in school, um, but the perpetuation of that, and you already know how to read and write, you're in a college class, but you have to continue to read and write. And the more you read and the more you write, the better you get at reading and writing. Um, so this really promotes literacy across the age range. So there's different kinds of organization that classrooms can have. Um, and the teacher expectations really affect student performance. So the teacher's motivation to engage students has a direct impact on the student's motivation and performance. We, however, see that this is more likely, that teachers are more likely to have positive expectations from children from higher socioeconomic status. This can have problems. Um, if you're expecting, you know, Johnny to do well because his parents are doctors and you're expecting um, G uh, Susie to do poorly because her parents um, are bus drivers, that's a problem. Um, and and, and this, this creates a system of bias that can have effects on children's education, on their development, these sorts of things. 
We also see that poor academic performance is typically correlated with um, problem behaviors and negative interactions with teachers. Um, but this is a correlation. So this is a chicken and an egg thing, right? So is it that the, um, the poor academic performance is creating a situation with problem behaviors and negative interactions with teachers? Or is it these negative interactions with teachers and problem behavior that's causing poor academic performance? Or is there a third factor that's going on um, that's influencing both? academic performance, negative interactions, and problem behaviors. Um, and so again, with this correlation, it's we don't know which one is causing which, but we do know that they are in relationship with each other. So we've talked about um, Broff and Brenner's ecological model, um, and we continue to kind of look through that lens at things. So when we're looking at education, we have the microsystem, and we have several different microsystems that are at play here um, in education. So one of the which we have is student-teacher interaction. We see that good teachers are caring and helpful and stimulating. However, we do see that too many use this repetitive drill kind of um, education where it's just rote and you do it over and over and over again until you get it. Um, and But we do see that students tend to have better achievement in stimulating classrooms. Um, so again, this teacher stimulation um, affects that child's outcome. We also see individual differences um, on behalf of the students. So students who are well beha um, behaved or high achievers get more attention. Um, and this, and we see that um, this has more of an impact of attention. We see there's more of an impact of attention on low socioeconomic students. So this teacher attention is valuable um, in the students' outcomes, but we see that it's even more valuable um, for students who come from low socioeconomic status. Um, status. And we also see the issues of self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, if a student thinks that they can't do something, they're not going to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I know as a, as a parent in a micro system, I repeatedly tell my daughter, especially about school stuff, we don't say can't. Um, because when you, she says, I can't do this, well, then she's not going to do it. Um, and so we don't, that self-fulfilling prophecy can be a problem. Um, that defeatist kind of nature can be a problem. Another microsystem um, that really affects education is the student-parent interaction. Um, we see that child-rearing practices really affect academic achievement. Um, and we haven't gotten to um, parenting styles again, um, but you covered them in your intro class. And we see that authoritative um, has those best outcomes. Just like we saw the best outcomes for child development we or child outcomes, we see them for academic performance as well and authoritative. Remember, authoritative is high control, but also high warmth. Um, and we see this across diverse cultures. So this isn't something that's unique in one particular culture. We see this again and again in different countries and different cultures. We see uninvolved parents, and those are the ones that, again, have the lowest control and the lowest warmth. Um, sometimes this can be um, really uninvolved parents, the extreme versions of those um, engage in neglect. We see those students have the lowest grades. Um, so we see this relationship between the microsystem of how students and parents are interacting um, and that child outcome in terms of academic performance. We also see that um, parents who engage in joint decision making with their children, where they give them the opportunity to help make the decisions about themselves, we see that these students typically do especially well um, in academic achievement. Um, this may be because they've been given so much modeling about how to make good decisions um, that when they get to school, when they get out from under kind of that parent um, kind of control um, or that parent supervision, they have they have experience making decisions, and so they can make good decisions for themselves. Other microsystems is the school itself. So we talked about not only the relationships within the school, but the location itself, the neighborhoods, the school, all of these things are part of the microsystem. And variations in school successes are often associated with the financial and physical resources available. Um, so if you're in a school in a high socioeconomic status, you may have all kinds of things at your educational disposal. Um, gardens and nature trails and, and yoga studios. I mean, the, the lists are endless in some of these high socioeconomic schools. 
However, when you're in a school that has a lower socioeconomic status, that doesn't have access to those resources, um, we really see that that can have different kinds of effects. Uh, we've talked about the better the input, the better the output. The same is true of schools. And when you have a more stimulating, healthy environment where it's comfortable environment to learn in, we see better performance um, than students who don't have that comfortable environment to learn in. We also see that schools need to set high goals for their students, but they need to be reasonable goals. They can't be so high that a student can't meet it. Um, they have to be a reasonable goal for within that child's um, capabilities, but it needs to be sufficiently high that they have to work towards it. And we need to see, we see that this is especially true, we see the best effectiveness when teachers really support to obtain these goals. So the goal is high, it's attainable, but you have to have support to really get those out. And we also see that this flexible, personalized teaching is really important for school effectiveness and student outcomes. And again, all of these things can really affect um, not only the effectiveness of the school, but the individual academic achievement of a student. So continuing with our Roth and Brenner, we'll go on to the meso system now. Remember, meso systems are that, um, that interplay between levels of the micro system. So the parent and the teacher interacting together. Um, we also see that the peer relations are important. So how peer relations um, affect um, school performance as well. We even see this in college. We see students who report um, having more engagement, more friends, more social relationships on campus are more likely to stay on campus and graduate um, as opposed to transferring or dropping out. And so sometimes that's why you see um, universities encourage on-campus living because you develop more relationships. You see universities encouraging student engagement outside of academics because you develop more peer relationships. And we see again that this can really affect school performance and graduation rates. Again, the parent-school partnership is going to be a huge cornerstone. I think our culture has done, and our research has done a pretty good job of getting that message out there that parent involvement is huge and it's super important. Um, we see that parent involvement in eighth grade is predictive of GPA in 10th grade. So the higher the parent involvement in eighth grade, the higher the GPA in 10th grade. Um, and we see this across socioeconomic status and across ethnicities. So this isn't something that's culturally specific. This isn't something that's only happening in the high socioeconomic status schools that have all these fancy extras, um, it's happening in all of the schools and that that parent involvement is really, really important. The importance of supportive communities, that communities work with the school and work with the school system um, that really support that. Um, you'll see a lot of times these parent-teacher associations or parent-teacher organizations, PTAs and PTOs, um, they reach out to the larger community. It's not just the parents and the teachers that are working together to kind of improve the school and improve the environment, but they go out to local businesses in the community. They go out to other, other um, organizations in the community and they work with them um, because we see that this is really an important facet um, of promoting education for our students. And finally, um, the importance of culture plays a huge role. Um, not only the cultural importance of education as a whole, because that um, and how that culture views education and, and how kids should be educated and all those pieces, but we also see that when instruction really matches the patterns of behavior from that child's own culture, we see the best success rates. Um, and so that's again why that flexibility um, of teachers can be very, very important, especially in multi-ethnic classrooms. And when you have a classroom that has students from, you know, you know, five different cultures or more, um, the teacher has to be flexible to work with those different kinds of patterns of learning that they're used to from their specific culture. Okay, let's move on to kind of the motivation to learn. Um, so again, we've kind of covered all this stuff in intro when you took this that class, which is why it's a prereq. Um, but motivation that's 
energize and direct and sustain our behavior, our kind of definition that we're going to work with. Um, and there's some, some of the motivation um, to achieve is influenced by attribution. So there's three attributions that we're going to talk about um, as they involve education. Um, one of which you're probably familiar with is kind of this helplessness orientation or this learned helplessness. And in this situation, people attribute their failures to personal inadequacies. And the problem with that is if it's a personal inadequacy, that's something that that person is seeing as unchangeable. And um, that's something about themselves they are unable to change. Um, and so I can't change it, so why try? So that attribution of those failures to themselves um, can create a problem in educational settings especially. We see students that really have this mastery orientation um, that persist despite failure, that focus on the task not their ability, and we really see that this is very important. We see this as a, a way for self-improvement. Um, so it's not, you know, how, you know, good you are at math. It's this one particular math problem. Um, so focusing on the task instead of the ability. We'll see that that will be important um, for beneficial educational outcomes and really affect students' motivation to learn. And we see that performance orientation um, um, can, can caught, be a detriment. And we'll talk about this one a little bit more too, all of these. Um, performance orientation is when we focus on the outcome of an activity rather than performing, um, rather than our skill. Um, so when you're concerned about a grade, um, whether over your learning. Uh, so those kinds of things, that's that performance orientation. Um, when you're worried about pleasing others, you know, you're wanting to perform well, um, a student's wanting to perform well to make mom and dad happy, um, those kinds of things. Wanting to get a good grade for that, as opposed to wanting to get a good grade want it because they learned, because they improved that skill. Um, I often say that you don't need to compare yourself to other students, you need to compare yourself to yesterday. Um, and that's because your work, it's focusing on improving that skill rather than the outcome of an activity. It's not that performance orientation. Um, it allows you a lot more of this mastery orientation where you're trying to focus on that skill, um, improving that skill, and not necessarily um, the, your comparison to others or that outcome of that activity. One of the theories that we talk about in this motivation to learn is Bandura's self-efficacy. And what this says is that individuals' belief about their performance capabilities in a particular um, domain are really important to this motivation to learn. Um, so, and we see that this is really positively correlated with self-regulation. Um, so your ability to kind of regulate yourself is, the better you're able to regulate yourself, the better you're going to have these views about your particular performance capabilities. Other things that are going to really influ influence this is intrinsic motivation. Um, so why are you doing something? If it's intrinsic motivation, that's going to be more that kind of mastery orientation. You're doing it because you're improving yourself and it feels good. Um, that, that feels good when you learn something. When that light bulb goes off, that's a good feeling. You're doing something for its own sake. However, that performance orientation um, is really that extrinsic motivation. Um, you're doing something in order to obtain a reward. You're doing something to get an A. You're doing something, um, kids sometimes, they, they're not even concerned about the A. They're concerned about maybe a reward their parents are giving them. So um, I remember when I was a kid, I had friends that got paid for grades. Um, they got paid a certain amount of dollars for A's, B's, C's. Um, and so they really focused on those outside rewards getting those A's. Um, my family wasn't like that. <laughs> my mom um, and dad were kind of like, hey, A's and B's, are, that's up to you. When you start getting C's, we'll start talking about how we can help you. Um, but the, if I was striving for an A or if I get, was getting an A, I was doing it more for my own sake that I really had this like mastery, this accomplishment of this skill rather than I was getting paid for an A versus a B. Um, so again, the, that intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation we'll see will be really important. We see the more we focus on extrinsic motivation, the lower the outcomes, where the more we focus on intrinsic motivation, um, the better the outcomes. Also, feedback from teachers and adults is going to be really important. So not only, you know, I've said, you know, that you don't want this performance, you don't want to be doing things to please others, you don't want that extrinsic motivation when you're doing it um, for, for somebody else, you're doing it to get some sort of reward 
But that feedback is important. Um, we've talked about it from the first day of this class, that feedback between you and I is really important in the education system. And that's no different um, than for, for children in the K through 12 system, that that feedback is important. What really needs to happen, though, is that feedback has to be um, constructive. Um, it's got to be in a way that's supportive. Um, so. On your rubrics for your source comparison papers, I always do my favorite part was. Um, so it doesn't matter what your grade was, you get what my favorite part of your paper was. That positive feedback is just as important um, as those criticisms um, that you can use to change and grow from. We also need to shift again from, um, we see that that shift from learning goals to performance goals can really interfere with students' ability to learn and that motivation to learn. When we're worried about the grade versus um, the learning, we see problems. Um, different universities handle their grades differently. Um, and when I was in graduate school, um, they were trying to switch graduate school grades from um, just an A, B, C, D system to the A plus, A, A minus system. And one of the reasons, the feedback that I gave was that was really shifting us from learning goals, especially as graduate students, to performance goals. I really don't think we should have this A plus minus situation because it really is shifting us from learning goals to performance goals. Um, another thing that can really affect our motivation to learn is tracking in the K through 12 system. So some um, high schools and um, education systems like that um, have what's called tracking, where ch students are put on either a college track or a vocational track. Uh, and while they can have benefits in terms of tailoring the education to the students that they're interested in these sorts of things, what we see overall is that the college track typically accelerates students' performance, where vocational tracks really diminish performance, especially when students are put on those tracks um, without feedback from themselves. So when a school says you should be on the vocational track and you should be on the college track, that really affects that performance. Um, when students are choosing, we don't see quite as that big of a difference, um, but it still is contributing. And of course, parents' encouragement um, can aid in developing this intrinsic motivation. We still want this intrinsic motivation um, so that, again, that don't compare yourself to somebody else. Compare yourself to you of yesterday. You know, that's, that's that internal, right? That's that. Um, and so that kind of encouragement from parents and teachers can really push that intrinsic motivation. Um, we see that students typically have better performance when they're intrinsically motivated, when they're interested in something, when they want to learn something, um, that they typically do better. So now we're going to shift a little bit and we're going to talk about um, different kinds of educational programs. Um, and first we're going to kind of focus on, we're kind of go, going to go starting with preschool, um, going along that developmental track. Um, so there's first in preschool, there's two main kinds of systems. One is the child-centered program, um, and this is teachers are providing a variety of activities from which children can select. Um, and much of the learning in these preschool programs and even into elementary school is taking place during play. Um, now, we don't see this model really something in high school and middle school as much, but it is something we still see in the elementary schools as well. Whereas academic programs, teachers are really structuring um, students' learning. We'll have a lesson plan, um, and these are the, the points that are going to be covered. Um, this can be, um, and again, these directed teaching letters, numbers, colors, and shapes, and other schools through formal lessons. That's not saying that child-centered programs don't teach letters, numbers, colors, and shapes, but they're doing that through this more play-based system, um, as opposed to doing it through kind of a sit-down um, and listen-to-me-speak situation. And there are preschools out there that are academic preschools. There are academic preschools for two-year-olds, where they're expecting two-year-olds to sit at a table or sit at a desk and listen to the teacher instruct them on these things. Um, what we find through research is that these academic programs in early childhood can really undermine emotional well-being and motivation. We talked about how important motivation was for learning and how especially that intrinsic motivation is really important for learning. And what we see is um, that these academic settings, especially in early childhood, um, can really affect that. When students aren't given um, the ability to move around, small children are, are, are supposed to be active. They're supposed to be getting into things. They're supposed 
forced to be running around. Um, and when they're told that they need to sit, um, that creates a situation where they have more stress behaviors because it's something that their body is not telling them to do. It's a very much a disagreement with what their body is telling them to do. And so we see more stress behaviors, more anxiety, more fidgeting, these kinds of things. We also see less, less confidence. Um, and this is going to be related to that motivation as well um, because they're not as interested and not as engaged in these things. They're not as comfortable with the materials as well. They're going to prefer less challenging tasks because of this lack of confidence. And we see that these children actually end up having less advanced motor, academic, language, and social skills in these academic programs in early childhood. So sitting, you know, putting a kid in some sort of, you know, preparatory um, program when they're very, very young is actually counterproductive in terms of developing good academic outcomes. What we really see is that kids that engage in play um, and are learning that way um, actually have the best outcomes. This is even something that's been talked about by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, we know that play equals learning. There's um, huge researchers out there that that's kind of their life's work that is all focused on that. Um, Kathy Hurst Pasek um, is one of them. Um, there's several different. Um, Allison Gopnik is another one where they really are focused on these. Um, and the idea is that the overriding premise is that play or some available free time in the case of older children and adolescents is essential to the cognitive, physical, social, and emotional well-being of children and youth. Um, so in schools where there, there are low, low socioeconomic status and they're trying to kind of funnel their resources more towards academics than to, towards specials like PE and music um, and recess and these kinds of things, we actually see that that's detrimental to those education. When you even look at elementary school students, um, students typically perform better after recess um, than they do before recess. Um, there are state laws in Georgia about how much recess students are required to have. I believe it's 20 minutes, um, but it's still pretty low when you think about you know, what play should be. Um, some schools have started introduce, introducing what they're calling brain breaks um, in addition to a recess, which is usually like a 10 minute period where kids are out running and doing these kinds of active things. Um, again, we see this is, this is really important for a number of different domains of well-being um, and academic achievement as well. Okay, so other kinds of programs still were kind of typically, these are tend to be more early childhood, but we do see these going into um, to older grades as well. They're just not as common. One of which is called Montessori. So Montessori is a, is a type of child-centered learning. So not all child-centered learning um, is Montessori, but all Montessori is child-centered learning. Um, it's kind of the, one of the more extreme versions of it. It's where it's really, really child-centered um, to the extent that teachers really are there to promote exploration and discovery. These are child chosen activities. Um, and we really see that these Montessori programs put an equal emphasis on both academic development and social development. We do see lots of really great positive outcomes from these Montessori type systems. Um, children in Montessori classrooms at age five um, have better academic tasks for tasks like reading and math. They have better, they're better in social tasks that require positive interaction with their peers and play. And they also at better at tasks that require attention to another person's beliefs, okay? So they're better at some of those theory of mind tasks um, as well. We see that children from Monterey classrooms at age 12 tend to like school more. Um, they're more creative in their writing. Um, and again, they're still having better scores um, in some of these um, more academic settings like reading and math as well. Um, we also see that early intervention is really important. We talked about the effect of socioeconomic status on children's, their educational settings and their environments and, and these sorts of things. What we'll see is that early intervention, especially for these low socioeconomic students, is really, really important. So um, Project Head Start um, is something that's a federally funded program, and it provides school, preschool, nutritional, and health services for low socioeconomic children. Um, and one of the things that's really central to this is parental involvement. We talked about how important 
important that is, how predictive that is um, of, of outcomes later in development. Well, if one of the reasons that they're doing it in, in this early intervention setting is to get parents set up from the beginning as involved academically in their children's lives. Um, so not only is it providing these preschool systems um, and nutritional and health services, but it's also helping um, really with that parent engagement part. Now, Georgia has... Um, Georgia Pre-K, um, so that's great where every, um, you know, four-year-old can get free preschool, um, and we see that that's really important, um, this early intervention. We talk about um, the better the input, the better the output. Um, again, if these children are being put into these child-centered preschools, we see great, great outcomes, and the state's pretty good about regulating them so that they're not strictly academic programs where they're really negative, um, have negative outcomes. But again, we see that this preschool school is really beneficial for kids. It's getting them this head start that they need. Um, we see that preschool experiences dramatically increase children's collaboration. Um, they have better social skills by as much as 62% and have less problem behaviors. Um, so this is really helping kids out um, in their ability to work with their peers and their ability to work with their educators. We see that um, preschool helps with communication. They have greater language skills by up to about 25%. They have better academic scores. Um, they're better at reading by 59%, writing and math by 50%. And again, these are typically these child-centered kind of preschools where they're still learning these things through play. Um, you know, writing, um, writing words in shaving cream or writing letters in... Um, in Play-Doh, those kinds of things. It's still writing, but it's still tons of fun. It's still playing. Um, and so we see this early intervention. Um, so you'll see, you know, uh, we're in a political season. Sometimes you'll see um, politicians really pushing um, for you know, universal preschool for students, and this is one of the reasons. We see across the board, um, it's one of the best things that we can do in an educated system to kind of improve our education. But again, if we're doing it in the, the, that child-centered way. Okay, so to continue on this kind of types of programs, um, there's no consensus on the best type of education, culturally speaking. Um, the research, you know, has a lot of consensus, and we know that child-centered is better than academic programs. Um, and we see those kinds of outcomes in older grades as well. Um, but culture hasn't caught up with uh, research, hasn't caught up with evidence. Um, so this is um, across advanced nations and emerging and developing nations. Um, the orange lines are think that education should be basic academic skills and encourage discipline. And the green bars think that um, education should be creative and that children should be taught to be thought independently. Um, and again, this is by culture. So the United States is down here. We're pretty split down the middle um, where we see 42% saying basic academic skills and encourage discipline, 48% saying think creatively and independently. And this is research that was done in, the, in 2016, so it's pretty recent. Um, the traditional classroom is that, um, that kind of basic skills and discipline, um, that teachers is the sole authority for knowledge, rules, and decision making. Students are relatively passive in this situation. They're listening and they're responding on when called to. They're completing a teacher assigned tasks. Um, but this is going to be that more um, discipline based um, kind of education. We see the other kind of classroom that kind of creating, um, or two, there's two that we'll talk about that kind of promote this independent thinking and creativity, one of which is the constructivist classroom. I um, mean, this encourages students to construct their own knowledge. Sometimes this comes out of Piagetian theory. So this first one will be Piaget's, the next one will be Vygotsky's. Um, and these often have learning centers and small groups. Um, so one table will be working on math, one table will be working on writing, um, and then they'll switch. Um, I know in my daughter's classroom, they've, you know, in earlier years, they did things called read the room, um, and they had to go around the room with a clipboard, and they had to, you know, find these various words and read them and write them and, and these kinds of things, go around and find these things. So this kind of active individual um, kind of learning centers. Teachers really guide and support in response to the child's needs. Um, and a lot of educational systems are kind of going this way. Um, Forsyth County, where my daughter goes to school, um, their grades th 
third grade and below are basically essentially based on this. They're, they don't have letter grades, they have numbers, and it talks about how much teacher support that they need um, for the activity. Um, or whether they're able to kind of not only do the activity, but do above that. I mean, it's based on these kinds of activities. The other one is um, Vygotsky's Social Constructivist Classroom. So it's still going to have some of that constructivist learning centers, but it's going to add on this social piece of it um, that Vygotsky liked. So the last one is more, you know, students as scientists. Um, this one's going to be more students as apprentices. Um, so these teachers and children are really partners, and there's many different kinds of symbolic communication that they do. Um, they still have these centers and these meaningful activities, um, but teachers are really focusing on keeping students in this zone of proximal development, um, really getting them into a place where what they can do with that more expert peer. We also see reciprocal teaching um, and cooperative learning. Small groups will work together towards a common goal. One of the interesting things um, that I saw on that Pew Center research that I just showed you from 2016 um, is that it's actually highly correlated, those whether you think it should be a discipline-based system and academic, um, basic skills versus creative thinking and independent are actually highly correlated um, with political ideologies as well. Um, so we see people that tend to be more liberal are saying more creative thinking and people that tend to be more conservative are saying basic skills and discipline. Um, and so we see that, um, that, that back and forth. You can see that in our political systems too. So let's think about, um, you know, the, the macro system. Um, when the more conservative party is in, in, um, in charge, they tend to have different focus on education as opposed to when the more liberal party is in charge. And so you can see how that macro system um, can affect um, students as well. Um, and academic achievement around the world, U.S., this is from 2015, um, is at the upper middle of the pack, but we're still in the middle of the pack worldwide. Um, so these are average scores of 15 year olds taking this um, program for international student assessment, which is given around the world to compare students. Um, it's the scores were from zero to a thousand. Um, and again, US here is in, you know, 500s for science and reading. Mathematics were lower than that. Um, the article that is linked in the supplements folder um, that has this also goes into kind of where we were in terms of ranking um, around the world. I believe we're 35th in one, we're 19th in another, um, so kind of where we are academically compared to other cultures. And again, that's going to be a, a reflection of a lot of different things, um, especially a lot of different things on our, mo our macro system, um, our political state, um, you know, who's, who's in charge, who's making the rules, um, our culture, what we say is important, what we say um, we want our students to learn, um, these sorts of things. And, um, and our ability to take the research um, and use it in a way that's really constructive for students. Okay, well that ends our conversation on education. Thanks.